Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. Our email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. Want to encourage you to reach out. Let us know what you think of today's show or any guest ideas that you might have. Jason at sportspectrum.com. And then check out our website, which is sportspectrum.com. Dot com. And we are presented today by Ronald Blue Trust. Their advisor is applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help clients make wise financial decisions to experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy. It's a good time to get our finances in order, do it from a biblical perspective, and Ronald Blue Trust is the place to go to. Check out their website, ronblue.com, ronblue.com. Excited to welcome Jessica Long to Sports Spectrum today. And if you know the Paralympic swimming world, you know the name Jessica Long. She is one of the most decorated Paralympic swimmers in history. Now, I could spend a good five to 10 minutes here explaining all the accolades. I'll go over just a few. She's won 23 Paralympic medals, including 13 gold medals. She has sponsorship opportunities with Nike, with Coca Cola. She's been the recipient of the U.S. Olympic Committee Paralympian of the Year multiple times. In 2007, she was a recipient of the ESPN Best Female Athlete with a Disability ESPY Award. She won that same award again in 2012. Another award she won was the U.S. Paralympic Sports Woman of the Year by the United States Olympic Committee. She's pretty darn good at what she does. And at age 12, she became the youngest Paralympic gold medalist ever in Athens in 2004. And she's been a staple there now every four years. And she was getting ready for 2020 in Tokyo. And now that's been postponed to 2021. Jessica was featured in an I Am Second video. If you know I Am Second and the I Am Second.com videos that they produce, so well done, where she told her story. And it featured video of her returning to meet her birth parents in Siberia. You see, Jessica was adopted at 13 months old from a Russian orphanage by American parents from Baltimore, Maryland. And she was also born with leg deformities, and she's an amputee. She's got a powerful story. She tells it very well here today on Sports Spectrum. Take a listen to Jessica Long one of the most decorated Paralympic swimmers ever here on Sports Spectrum. Jessica, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So glad to see you. So glad to talk to you. We're taping this on Zoom as uh, the pandemic has pretty much made us all experts of Zoom. Uh, Before we share your journey and your story and so much so much there I think I want to dive into with you let's start with kind of now and how this has been for you uh the Paralympics I presume like the traditional summer Olympics uh have been postponed and are now not happening in 2020 so how has this quarantine pandemic time been like for you kind of having to press pause just like the rest of us have yeah, for sure. Um, it's definitely, it's had its ups. I've had my ups and downs. I've had good days, bad days. Um, I recently got married in October. So right before all of this hit. Um, so I'm quarantined right now with my new husband. Um, so he's working from home. I'm home. And I think, you know, just hanging in there, um, trying to remain positive, but at the same time, allowing myself to, to just feel sad and, and call someone and reach out and, and, we're all figuring out our new normal. Um, so there's just no right or wrong way to quarantine. I like to stay busy. So I've painted everything. I've tried to remain, you know, keeping up my PT as an athlete now that Tokyo is postponed a year, but just hanging in there. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, what is training like right now? Are you still able to kind of find a play? I mean, what does training look like normally, I guess. And then in the pandemic, how have you been able to keep that going? Yeah. So training normally is pretty intense. I, I mean, that's my job, right? I'm um, training full time. So I'm pretty used to getting to the pool around 5.30, 6 a.m., stretching for about 45 minutes recovery. 
um, getting in the pool swimming for two hours and then maybe heading over to the gym and getting another hour and a half lift in. And by this time it's what, like 11, I, I'm tired. I go home, I'm eating lunch, I'm taking a nap and then I go back and swim another two hours. Um, but it's different every day. I mean, but for the most part, I'm always busy with swimming. So right now in quarantine, when everything was announced and all the pools shut down, I'm just trying to get creative and find different ways to stay in shape, which it's really difficult. Um, but also, again, like I think mental toughness comes in, just going through the motions, visualizing, because we will come to an end, I hope. I think we will. I hope we will. We're all praying for that, of course. Jessica Long is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. All right, your journey is a fascinating one to me, Um, and it's one where uh, I didn't know a lot about until the I Am Second video, which I want to encourage people to go check out over at IamSecond.com. It's on YouTube as well. Really kind of painted a good picture of not only your personal journey of being born in Russia and Siberia and being adopted, which I want to kind of get to a little bit in a minute, but your faith journey as well. And that's where we'll dive deeper, I think, into this conversation here. But share with us a little bit that early story of being adopted. You were 13 months old, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. It's it's hard to narrow it down, but um, I was put up for adoption from by a 16-year-old Russian girl. And just due to a birth effect, she wasn't able to take care of me. So she put me up for adoption in a Russian orphanage. And during that time, there was an American couple here in Baltimore that had two children, couldn't have any more. They try, I mean, I think they, they tried for like 10 years. Um, it was called Second Infertility. And um, they got word that there was this little girl over in Russia with leg deformities. And they decided they were going to go all the way to Russia. They were going to get another little boy. Um, so my dad, Steve, went to Russia in 1993 and got me and Josh, uh, change your names, um, to Jessica and Joshua. Mm-hmm. And... Super cool. Uh, Josh had a cleft lip and palate. I was born with something called fibular hemimelia. So within, so being adopted at 13 months, within five months, I mean, they were seeing specialists. They were seeing so many different people getting all sorts of opinions on whether to keep the foot that I had or amputate it so I could wear the prosthetics. And I'm so glad because they decided to amputate at 18 months old. And I was fitted with prosthetic legs uh, almost immediately and then learned to walk within a couple weeks. And um, it's super cute. They, they've told me that they scheduled a, um, a physical therapy appointment and then just canceled it. Like, I never needed it. I just, I mean, kids adapt. I adapted with two prosthetics and yeah. I've been unstoppable ever since. That's right. I love that. And I love the, the title of your book, too, is on Unsinkable, which is a connection, which I thought is that that's where you were going there, Jessica. It would have been a perfect play, right? Yeah. <laughs> but tell me about the side, because Unsinkable obviously has its, its own wording in, in association with swimming. Where does swimming become something for you, a passion for you, you know, the earliest kind of memories getting into that world? Well, yeah, I, I knew it was different growing up, right? You didn't have to tell a girl with no legs that. I clearly looked different and, and people would stare. And, and I definitely, I mean, that came with its own challenges. And, and being an amputee and what I was born with, I had to get surgeries every couple months. And if we got the right leg done, it was the left leg. And it was just a constant battle of just not overcoming one obstacle, but overcoming multiple obstacles and learning how to walk all over again every six months. So for me, I... I loved being active. I think because I had to really sit still and, and go through a surgery that some adults have never gone through as a little, I mean, every six months. And my parents always try to make it fun. You know, I got popsicles and I got to watch movies and, and I got to have a like pink cast. I always got to pick my colors, but I really fell in love with sports and movement and being a part of a team. Um, you know, I was homeschooled. So I came, I mean, I'm from an amazing family, but I love, like, I wanted to go to school. I wanted to be a part of the sports world. So, yeah, I mean, again, it's so hard to narrow it down. And I can just go off in all sorts of different directions, but I fell in love with swimming when I was 10 years old. And I loved the, I, I loved taking off my legs. Even now, like I'm most comfortable with my legs off. It's kind of like wearing shoes. You know, you just, you don't wear, I mean, I just take them off as soon as I get in the house. But swimming was my first love and I showed up and I loved just the way that I was treated. You know, I was a competitor. I I loved racing the girls with legs and in swimming, you're actually in Paralympics, you're not allowed to wear any form of prosthetics. So it was the perfect sport. Mm. 
That's interesting to me. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about what you were saying about the surgeries and just being a kid. Kids are cruel. Kids are beautiful, but they can be cruel too, especially in that, you know, elementary stage of first to fifth grade and, and certainly into middle school. How, you were homeschooled, but still, I'm sure you had friends. I'm sure you were out, whether it was church or other places where, you know, people were encountering you. Did you have to kind of deal with some of that cruelty Surprise. that kids have? Surprisingly, no. I, That's good. I think it's changed, right? I, I Again, my parents, Steve and Beth, really taught me from a young age, even though I was feisty and fierce, they they really um, just kind of kept repeating that kids are curious and and they really are, you know, as I've gotten older and I go and share my story to different schools, I mean, it's like 30 seconds. I mean, when I, when I ask kids and, and I, I'm speaking to a large group at a school and I'm like, you want me to take off my leg? I mean, they get so excited and their imaginations are wild. So I never dealt with bullying as a kid. That's if good. anything more as an adult, I've had to really, really learn patience and just like, I, like you're an adult. Like I, I get a lot of, you know, parking and handicap, you know, I'm a young girl. I'm athletic. I, unless you really pay attention to my legs, you don't always notice. But, um, but if anything, again, I just have to remember that like people, you just don't know. And there's invisible stuff, you know, we just don't know. You said you fell in love with swimming at 10. And if I'm doing the math, two years later, you're in the Paralympics as one of the youngest ever to compete, if not the youngest, and you're the youngest, I believe, to win a gold medal in Athens. So, what happens in those two years? Because something clicks, obviously, if you're going from falling in love with the sport to being one of the top people competing in that sport. Yeah, it was wild. Um, I joined that team at 10. And I think for me as a you know little 10-year-old, there was such a fire and I just felt like I finally like belonged in something. But at the same time, like I never, I never wanted my legs to hold me back. I never wanted to be the girl with no legs. And that came into play in sports and, and I didn't want special treatment. I think most Paralympic athletes you talk to, that we don't want special treatment. We want to do everything that everyone else is doing and do it a little bit better, like missing an arm or a leg or whatever challenges we face. So joining a swim team, it was no different. I showed up every day and I also had really amazing coaches who invested time in me. And we would spend, I mean, that's the time of development. So within the stroke, we were spending hours. Like I remember spending three hours one time on pinky placement and how you grab the water. And I had to find unique ways with not having a kick to navigate the water. And it really is body awareness and body positioning. And it's so interesting to me because even now I'll jump in and I've had people be like, I'm sw like, I've wanted to share their swimming lane and they see this girl with their legs and they're like, I'm swimming fast today. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like I'm, a, I am a good swimmer, but it did. It can't, I mean, I think talent, but at the same time, hard work. And I think people would be really surprised, you know, putting in hard work and consistency and what it can do. And it brought me to the Paralympics as a 12 year old and I was not expected to go let alone go and win three gold medals and it set the bar high and expectations and all those little pressures you feel. Jessica Long is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Your story of coming to faith in Christ um, was featured in the I Am Second video and you talked a lot about that. There's, there's a bunch of different things in that video that you alluded to that I'd really like to dive into in terms of identity and other things like that. But, and I want to, again, encourage people to go to IamSecond.com. If you are featured in an I Am Second video, that means you have a faith journey and a faith story. And that's what we love about the work that I Am Second does. So I'm going to have you in, however you want to share it, share a little bit of your testimony uh, and kind of growing up as a believer, I believe, and then kind of figuring out who Jesus was and giving your life to him. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a really great Christian household. Um, you know, we did Bible in the morning, we prayed. We also like did Bible as like a curriculum. Um, God was everywhere. We went to church, you know, it was just such a norm. It was such part of our routine. And, and in a way I'm super thankful for that. Some of my siblings, like my little sister, Hannah, who wrote my book, she accepted Christ as her savior at four years old. And it's not to say that it hasn't come with her own struggles, but for me as a kid, I just, I challenged everything, you know, that determination is great in the pool, but in the real world, I mean, everyday life with my mom and homeschooling and, you know, God. And, and yeah. I just, 
really struggled with this idea that I was ever good enough and that all I had to do was ask for forgiveness. It just seemed almost so simple. But at the same time as like my little brain worked, you know, the idea of being adopted into God's family. And that's what I would hear a lot. I was like, well, I don't even know if I like adoption. Like I'm the only blonde in my family. And, and even though you know you're adopted into such a great family, there's still this disconnect that you weren't wanted by your birth mom. And even though my parents always worded it well, you know, that you were part of God's plan to come to our family. And, you know, thankfully she did, she did the best thing. It wasn't because of your legs. I heard all the right things, but at the same time, you know, your faith, your faith, it has to be your own. And my parents were really great with being like, you know, like it was never pushed upon us, but it was, you're under our household. So this, I'm, I promise I'm winding down. So no, I you're fine. Long, a long journey of feeling like, I mean, all my life I've done everything on my own, right? Like in a sense, I've gone through surgeries. I've picked myself up, but never given up. I've never quit. So in my head, I was just like, I don't need God. Like, I don't need help. I can do it. I've done it. I've gone through these surgeries. And now looking back, obviously I can see God in every one of those scenarios and being there with me. And even now as things have gotten, you know, I, I still have trouble walking and I rely on God for that. But it kind of came to a point where I was living out at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs training. And I feel like I had done all the worldly successes. I had won gold medals. I had signed a deal with Nike. I had a Coca-Cola commercial. I had, was it? walked right carpets with celebrity. I mean, I'd done all these worldly amazing things and it it never felt enough, no matter what. I I just never felt enough. And I felt, you know, just that I wanted to be enough at some point. So I was going to church consistently in Colorado and it's really cool because I think, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It was three years of showing up to my Bible study, to church, you know, having a community, right? A community of believers. And again, I fought God on everything, but there was just this moment in June of like 2013 that I just felt it on my heart that I didn't want to question if I was a believer or not. And the big thing that I kept saying was I wanted to give God my whole heart and not just part of me, right? Just, I didn't want to give him just my Sunday or my, my weekends. I wanted to give him, you know, a Wednesday afternoon when I'm struggling or just to have all of me. And he certainly knows that I'm going to fail. And I, I even becoming a Christian, it's been harder if anything, just not being as angry, you know, anger is such a comfortable emotion, yeah. So it's been a long journey. I'm still learning, but being vulnerable and sharing that with people that, you know, yeah, I, I just wanted to be a part of God's family and not fight them all the time. Yeah. Well, in the I Am Second video too, you talked about allowing yourself to kind of be angry with God, which I think is is a healthy thing in some cases, not angry all the time at, all, at everyone, but just kind of saying, God, what are you doing here? You said that you had some issues or some some thoughts about, you know, okay, you're the you're the amputee and the leg deformities and you're looking, God, why did you do this to me? There were some moments there where you really struggled with, um, I guess, anger towards God, right? Yes. Yeah. I forgot that whole part. Um, that's okay. Yeah. There's always a lot of little, yeah, I think, I think growing up, I just, I didn't understand and I just was in so much pain. And even now my, my legs do hurt me a lot and, and we've tried so hard to get good like good, a good fit in my prosthetics. But, um, but as a little girl, it was easy to think that like I did something wrong and, or what did I do wrong? Right. And just feel really angry at God who made me an amputee. You know, I was like, well, I, I don't, you don't even know what you did. You know, as a little girl, it's hard to comprehend that God's going to use you in this big way. And that swimming eventually is going to come into play and it's going to give you this platform to reach other people. Right. I, I definitely think that's been one of the coolest things is, reaching other people through my story, my testimony. But as a little girl, you just can't comprehend. And even like, I couldn't comprehend adoption. I couldn't comprehend missing legs. I couldn't comprehend going in for another surgery. And as a little, like I remember as a little girl, not understanding why I had to go back to the hospital, but I always called it a hospital. I was like, I don't, I don't, I never wanted to go back. And I knew, I knew it when I, I had to go to this place and get my blood drawn and figure out, make sure everything was okay for that surgery. I knew when that was happening, it was coming again. And there was a time that I was playing out my, grandparents pool and the bone on my leg like came through my skin and I just mm. kept playing because I was like I don't want to go back and that was really dangerous you know just for infection but sure I just felt really angry and I felt frustrated and no one could give me the right answers you know no one could they they said all the right things right you know they said the most positive things but I just felt really angry at God and frustrated. And even now, I mean, there's a fire within me. I'm still feisty that I'm still passionate and it's great in swimming. But when I'm in real life, you know, I have to figure out ways to tame it. (laughs) And then I question, you know, it's easy to question like, why did you make me so feisty? And Mm -hmm. 
But I also learned that um, that feistiness has helped me in my swimming and that platform to share my story. We'll get back to our conversation with Jessica Long in just a little bit, but want to tell you more about Ronald Blue Trust, the company's certified financial planning professionals offer comprehensive financial planning and investment management services based on biblical principles to individuals and families across the U.S. who are beyond the debt problem stage but want to be good stewards of their wealth. COVID-19 has caused many of us to have some questions about our finances. And back a couple months ago, we actually had Don Christensen on from Ronald Blue Trust to answer a few of those questions. And listen, they are the best when it comes to finances. They do it through a biblical lens, so you know their heart is in the right place. And they work with a lot of different types of people, specifically professional athletes, where they've had over 35 years of experience in serving pro athletes and coaches. They can serve you too. If you want to check them out, go to ronblue.com and see if they're a fit for you. Ronald Blue Trust. Check them out at ronblue.com. Now back to our conversation with Jessica Long, Paralympic gold medal winner here on Sports Spectrum. And I've talked to a ton of athletes on this show about achievement, and it can really consume you when you are at the highest level and you're winning and you're getting gold medals, 13 of them in Paralympic, um, in the Paralympics. And then, like you said, walking red carpets and being a part of the ESPYs and, and places like that and winning awards. And yet our faith is not found in any achievement. So Walk us through that battle and that sort of push-pull that I think is not just your experience, Jessica. It's all of us who want to achieve and do well and have amazing things happen, and yet releasing that and understanding that achievement is not where we can find our identity in the world. It's where we can find our identity in Christ. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, and that, it's a journey, right? I, sw- I think every single person has to go through that because, I mean... As athletes, it's easy, not even just athletes, right? It's easy to find your identity in anything. And yeah. it's hard, especially when you're getting worldly success and to feel like that's enough and people recognize it. And I knew I had met at every Olympic athlete, huge name in the game. Like I was, I mean, so many cool people I had met through this journey. And it's just easy at that point to feel like this is where your worth comes from and that you have to win the next gold medal and win, set the next world record and get the next. And, and it's really empty because you never, you really never end up feeling enough. And it's hard, right? It's hard to explain this to someone who hasn't gotten to the top yet. And I think what it is about sport, I don't, I don't know if within the Paralympics or the Olympics, a gold medal is such a tangible thing. Like you could act, I mean, you hold it, it's heavy. And even at this point in my life, it's still hard to navigate that, those thoughts, right? Like I want to win gold medals. There's nothing wrong with winning gold medals. It's when it becomes, it's when it consumes you and that you feel like you're not worthy without one. Mm-hmm. Without, with one, without one. I always get that one confused, but yeah. It, and, it, and it is, it's adapting your thinking. Like right now, I, I know that I'm enough without a gold medal. I know that I've, I've been to the top of my career and it's trying to figure out ways to still swim and train to get to the top, but also know that that's not going to fulfill you. And it's, it's appreciated that God's giving me again, this platform and it's super cool but yeah, it's not, it's not as fulfilling as you would think. And if anything, like most of the Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes that I know who have gotten to this point, really cool believers. I mean, our medals are in like, my medals are in my closet. Like, I think I've learned that they represent the hard work, the journey, the sacrifice, the people who got me there, right? It wasn't just me. Um, it was my parents who drove me back and forth to practice when I didn't have my license. It was my mom giving me all the nutrition. It was sports psych. It, it's, it's, every single person on that journey. So I look at it more like, yes, I got to the top, but it represents more of the community that, you know, helped me succeed. The identity that you, that you describe, does it help now in being able to handle failure? I don't even want to call it failure because let's say you don't win the gold medal and you get a silver or bronze or you don't even medal, you know, in the, in the eyes of the world, it's failure, I guess, that, hey, she's got all these gold medals. How could she not win it? Does it help you handle success differently or the lack of success that might come from swimming because of the way that your faith has now become the identity in you? It's hard. You know, I had accepted Christ when I, in 2013, so I was like, what, 21? 
Yeah. And I moved home. I started, if anything, like I moved home after accepting Christ, finding in a really secure, like Christian environment. And I moved back home to train with Michael Phelps, Bob Bowman, other Olympic athletes. I was the only Paralympic athlete training with Olympic athletes, which was huge. Yeah. I mean, that's hard, right? You kind of get sucked into the swimming world. And even though I know that I given my heart to Christ, um, I was training, you know, I had big goals in mind and, and navigating that relationship with Christ and keeping him at the forefront, but also like you want to win a gold medal. And, and it's easy to say that your identity isn't in swimming, but when it's again, taken away from you, like in Rio 2016, I was the world record holder in almost every event. And it took me till day 10 to win a gold medal. Mm. And it's so easy to view that as failure. And there was a lot of political stuff in classification. And those girls moved classes within, because we're all in classification. They yeah. moved classes within um, six months, but they still got to keep the gold medal. It was, so that was kind of, that's, a, that's confusing. But I remember thinking that God was going to challenge me and stretch me till day 10 to win a gold medal. And how easy it is to be like, oh, my identity is not swimming. But when I was not, when I was there at the Paralympics and I wasn't winning a gold medal till day 10. And even if I didn't win that gold medal, it was still like, okay, God does have a plan. And I really learned in that, those 10 days, which is high, it's intensity. There's thousands of people you're swimming in front of and you're exhausted and you're, you're racing and it's performance. It's just really hard to not, in, in a way at those lowest points in our careers or athletic careers, just to rely on God in those moments. And that's something that I really learned. And I, I didn't really learn that when I was winning, like I was like, oh, thanks God. Like, cool. Next one. Like, but right. when you're at your lowest point and you don't understand why God, like it's happening. It's, I think those are the biggest life lessons that like God is still there through all of that pain, the, that worldly pain to feel like a failure, but I wasn't. I don't know if that's making sense, but no, that makes complete sense. That's very well said, I think, Jessica. Um, let me let me get to our last few questions here, and I know our time is 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 coming to an end. Um, this kind of comes full circle with you from the adoption side of things, um, because you actually were able to reunite with your uh, birth family in Russia, and that was featured in the I Am Second video as well. I'm just wondering, kind of, how that came about and what that experience was like. I saw an 18 hour train ride was in there. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is going through so much, but it was such a cool experience to watch you um, kind of come and come encounter, come in to an encounter with your, your birth mom. Can you share a little bit about that? Thanks. Yes. Yeah. It's, it was amazing how it all worked out because through swimming is how I ended up finding my birth family. Um, they, I got word that a Russian reporter had went and found my biological mom in wow. Russia um, about two weeks before I was competing at the London Paralympics. And at this games, you know, I, 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 God was working my, my heart and my life, but I wasn't really, again, I hadn't given him my whole heart. So like successes were coming. I had, I had like seven major sponsors. One of them, I mean, Visa, I, I mean, I, I had my face on the credit card, like super cool. <laughs> yeah. So I was not prepared for that year or that moment two weeks before the Paralympics um, to find out that she had found them or found my family and my whole family, my coaches, everyone. Um, Cause I was in it. I was in the games. It's I competed for nine days straight and that is so mentally hard. I mean, you're getting about an hour of rest throughout the day and then there's so much going on, but they weren't going to tell me, they weren't going to tell me till after the games were over, but I was like, I already knew I was going through it. So when I got home, um, we ended up watching, we saw this, not only did they find my birth mom, they found a whole birth family and it was hard cause we had to get translators and you just don't even know how to process because you just finished the Paralympics and you have the post Olympic blues and all of a sudden they were going on like the Oprah Winfrey show of Russia. Like they thought we later got word that they told my family that I was going to come out at the end in this big reunion. But I was like, I'm not even there. Yeah. So it was just a really hard time to process it. And I do think everything God's timing, right? Like I become, I really given my heart to Christ. Um, that following year, even when I got word with my family and then six months later, if I'm getting this timeline right, um, NBC approached us and just asked if we wanted to go to Russia and meet my family. Mm. And it was an opportunity that I knew we couldn't pass up. And, and it's really, it was hard. It was one of the hardest things ever, I've ever done. I mean, I thought it was really tough, but when you're going to Russia with an, the crew, I mean, an NBC crew, you're just meeting. And I had my sister and my parents stayed back. Um, 
it was just one of the hardest things. And it's so funny. I remember landing and thinking like, I don't know if they even want to see me. Like, why am I doing this? And I was on the, I went right to like an elliptical machine and I was on it for three hours. And my sister, Hannah, who wrote the book, my book and the story, um, she sat there just reading a book, like letting me like take it all in. But it was hard. You know, it was one of the hardest things. And I think in that moment, I truly felt forgiveness. I felt, you know, I, I had God had forgiven me. So I just felt like I could forgive her. And now in my life, a lot of people can't really always relate to being an amputee, but I've gotten so many good responses about the adoption piece and not feeling enough. And that's been really cool in that sense to reach people. So cool. I think it was neat um, to see that story in it, the way it was told through I'm Second and the NBC um, crew doing that. Um, were you Were you happy that you did it when you look back? I'm very happy that I did it. I don't know if I would do it with cameras. Mm. At the same time, I don't have kids yet. So who knows what that, when I can actually share that, you know, like I can't imagine the, the amount. I think the thing that gets me is the selfless love that my birth mom had. Like she, from what I've been told in our communication, she only had 10 minutes with me and then just like, they got, you know, they just take you. <laughs> mm. So I think it's going to be really cool eventually to show my family or my my kids one day if I have kids, but yeah. it's hard. And the thing was, I don't know if people knew this is my story was like a positive story and Russia right now, there's still a Russian ban to the U S you can't adopt. And I think they were trying to get like, my story was so positive that they were trying to get it like, changed. And at one point I gave a statement to Putin. And I was like, I mean, I was being coached on what to say. Wow. And um, at that point when I walked and saw my mom and the I am second video, I think they showed it. There was, there were people with like, there was like bodyguards. There was people on roofs. I mean, it was like 30 cameras. It wasn't just our NBC crew. It was Russia One TV had a deal with my family. So they were in the house and there was like three translators. And that's a lot for anyone, but to be 21, I mean, I think I was just 21. I was, it was a lot to, it was a lot to do it in the public eye in some sense. And everywhere we went, I mean, at one point that morning we were meeting my family, we sent like a, like a car where like, all the reporters thought I was in the car and I went like secretly down like another way. Like it was crazy. Wow. Very, it sounds very staged. Not that it's, it doesn't take away from the idea that you were going to get to meet them, but I understand, I guess, why you would do this without all the fanfare if you were to do it over again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And now the next thing is, you know, I, I would love to have my birth mom and my mom um, watch me compete in the Paralympics. So that's kind of what we, we we're working on. We hope that, kind of happens but we don't know yeah Um, but yeah it was wild and just how everything kind of came full circle um yeah that's cool last question thank you so much for your time you've been so generous um what's the prayer that you've been praying or maybe the thing that god's been teaching you and showing you most over these past few months he teaches us lessons all the time but specifically in the couple months here that we've been in this pandemic um what's the great lesson or maybe the prayer that you've been praying the most that god's been showing you during this time Yeah, um, for sure. And that's a really, I have not been asked that question yet. I would have to say life was getting really busy. I had gotten married in October and I planned a wedding, like, you know, a whole year. And that's really hard. And I competed at a world, I competed at worlds in September, like three weeks before we got married and just life was getting so busy and it's so easy when it gets busy, right? We all get busy to kind of forget about God in a way and just, you know, and how much you need them all the time. And it's okay to go through seasons of busyness, but um, it got really bad there, right? I was doing um, media summits. I was in LA back and forth one time, like three times in a week, back and forth to LA from Baltimore to LA. And and the busyness, and I think sometimes in our culture, in our world, we, busyness is like, is viewed as like a success or like, I don't know. I was, I was just so exhausted. And that's not to say that this pandemic, you know, I know that it's caused a lot of pain. I know there's a lot going on in the world. But it's just really God has taught me just to rest, which is hard, right? Like within the first two, within the first week, I painted the living room, I painted the fireplace. Like I like to be busy. I think busyness is, it's easy to avoid things, right? I think swimming has always helped that, swimming, getting through things. Um, but I've had to really get to the root of just sitting still. And I think we're all kind of going through that, right? It's it's hard. I have ups and downs with, within the hour. So just relying on God and and trying to like, just sit still and and see what he is teaching me or what he wants to teach me in this time that he literally has taken everything away from us. Uh, Just rely on him 
and call out on him through these times. That's good. Jessica, thanks so much. Really appreciate you being on the show and uh, continued success. And hopefully we'll be watching you compete uh, in, I guess, a year or so. But thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And many thanks to Jessica Long. And uh, I thought she was really good at talking about identity and talking about success and talking about learning from failure. Listen, when you're the most decorated Paralympic swimmer ever, you don't fail a whole lot. I mean, she's won 23 medals and 13 gold medals at the Paralympics. And, you know, she still has that drive and determination and that feistiness, as she said, to continue to compete and and accomplish and achieve. But you can also hear that she understands that her identity is not in being a Paralympic swimmer. Her identity is found in who Jesus Christ says she is and who Jesus Christ is. And so cool to see her living that out now with the platform that she has as a Paralympic swimmer, but even more importantly, as a follower of Jesus. Awesome stuff there from Jessica. Really really wish her nothing but the best and thank her for being here on the show today. We also thank you for listening. Again, our email address is jason at sportspectrum.com. That goes directly to me. I would love to hear from you. Any feedback that you have, any thoughts on this episode or future guest ideas, you can reach me at jason at sportspectrum.com. And one last request I'd love to have you do, go to the Apple podcast app. I'm assuming most of you listen to podcasts on Apple. It might be Spotify as well, or Google Play, or wherever podcasts are found. But please leave a review, especially on Apple Podcasts. That helps get the word out about the podcast, just letting us know that you liked it, uh, recommending it to other people. So leave a review, if you could, on Apple Podcasts. Again, we thank you for listening. We also thank our partners and sponsors, Ronald Blue Trust. They can handle all of your financial questions and needs, doing it through a biblical lens helping you to be good stewards of your wealth. Check them out at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. Thank you again so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. We love you guys. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Please do stay safe.